We are joined by spectator, contributor and fellow ADH TV host with his own show, Save the Nation, Professor David Flint. Welcome to Spectator TV. I'm delighted to be on this uh, program. Well, we will get to the appointment of the Governor-General in just a moment, but first I'd like to talk to you about the story that broke a few days ago. Down in Victoria, the land of the not-so-free, the Labor Premier Jacinta Allen has decided to ignore the voice of the people following the referendum and is instead pushing ahead with a treaty. Of course, this treaty is all about money, how to get more of it and how to rip off the taxpayer as much as physically possible. The difference with the treaty in the Victoria is that they are considering making taxes and benefits dependent upon your race. At the treaty of the statewide gathering, one of the leaders said, and I quote, Aboriginal people must be exempt from land tax, including stamp duty and council rates. She wants interest-free loans and free tertiary education as compensation for people being robbed of their land. David, what happens to Australia when we start developing taxation systems based upon race? Well, this is appalling and completely unacceptable. It probably breaches the laws about discrimination uh, and uh, I don't think it would be acceptable electorally. In fact, the people showed that overwhelmingly, did they not, in the referendum, when we had an enormous percentage against the referendum Many of the people voting for it, not voting for the racist aspects of the proposal, they're actually voting out of sympathy for the Aboriginal people. Yes, and sympathy is not going to include one part of society paying taxes and the other part not paying taxes. I suspect if we had had a referendum on that topic, David, the no vote would have been much higher than it was this time around. But, David, if we have a community of people living side by side in a financial crisis and their taxes are dependent upon what they look like, not only will that res fuel resentment and violence, surely it will also lead to taxpayer people abandoning that area. Are you surprised Labor is doing this, considering they are meant to be the party of the working people? Because it seems a bit like uh, racial segregation, and that's what our whole system of government is supposed to avoid. I mean, it's equality, right? It is, and that's Australian. And I think it's very un-Australian to be proposing this. And given the, the complete absence of any control over the determination as to who is an Aboriginal person, and we have, for example, seen the cases where people are obviously not Aboriginal, and uh, Andrew Bolt makes a point, for example, of naming one of them. This, this seems to me to be just a very foolish thing to do. People will be persuaded, there'll be an incentive to declare yourself in, Indigenous, and then there will be questions about whether a person is Indigenous or not. This is, this is foolish, and I agree with you, it goes against the traditions of the Australian Labor Party. I'm looking forward to you being the new Minister for Indigenous Affairs, David. That could be <laughs> your next role. But let's have a little chat about the newly appointed Governor-General. This is the highest and arguably most important office in the land. It is the check and balance for political power in our system. People need to know that not only can a person in this role be prepared to dismiss a government that they have to, that the public need to believe that they will do that. For this reason, the Governor-General is not meant to be an overtly cosy person with other political parties. David, is the new Governor-General a suitable choice or do you think Albanese could have done better? Well, of course, if I were the Prime Minister, I would not have uh, suggested Ms Rostin. I don't even know her. Never heard of her until uh, I, I read about her being appointed. The, the problem is that those who support the constitutional monarchy as it is treat the appointment of the Governor-General, the process for appointment, the, the choosing and the recommendation to the King, as something similar to judicial appointment. And uh, the, the Prime Minister is invested with the power to make the recommendation. He should, of course, under the, under the documents which establish this process, first run this past the palace to make sure there are no problems before a formal recommendation is made. Just about, ev not every, but certainly ever since the practice began, of appointing Australians to the position, there have been many times on which the appointment has been criticised. I would think on just about all of those cases where the appointment is criticised at the time, not afterwards, but at the time of the appointment, uh, 
All of those have proved to be wrong. The very first was Sir Isaac Isaacs, and the reason was that he had, did have a political background and that as a judge he proved himself to be very strongly affiliated in, with ideas to concentrate federal power in Canberra. And there was a petition to the king against his appointment. Uh, but, but he did turn out to be a very proper Governor-General. He didn't have the, the occasion to exercise greatly the reserve powers. The, the second was, uh, and this was even more stark in terms of appointing a politician, that was the appointment of uh, Sir William McKell. He wasn't a knight then. He was a former or retiring Labour <laughs> Premier of New South Wales. I, actually, I looked at what he did as uh, Premier of New South Wales and I thought a lot of that was very good and the sort of things you would expect uh, a Conservative government to be doing. But his, his appointment was attacked by Sir Robert Menzies and it was later Sir Robert Menzies who was gratified with the appointment because when it came to exercise the discretion as to whether a double dissolution would be granted, a lot of people in the Labour Party thought, ah, now we've got him. He won't, he won't agree to the appointment because it's a matter within the reserve powers and he'll refuse that. But uh, very properly, the grounds being established for a double dissolution, Sir William McGill granted that double dissolution. And the third example was Bill Hayden. That was very much attacked. Mr Howard attacked it because he saw it as being the consolation prize that Hawke... Uh, gave Hayden when he overthrew him as Labour leader. But uh, Hayden proved to be a, a, a very good Governor-General and later on when he was appointed, after he was Governor-General, he was appointed to the uh, Constitutional Convention. And he did what John Howard wanted, that is he, he drafted what he thought was the ideal republic. But at the time he said, I'm doing this because that's my duty as a member of the Convention, but I do say that the present system that we have is better than this and I would stay with the present system. And he said at the time, as he said on a number of occasions, I'm not a Republican, I'm not a monarchist, but I believe in the existing system. Well well, I do want to ask you two questions here. The first is the role is not meant to be a political role. We can certainly all agree on that. And it should not be held by a Republican, all things being equal. And the same goes for the governors. Now, I raised serious objections to the former chief health officer in Queensland being handed the role of governor by Labor government, because given that the most serious abuses of citizen rights happened under her influence with the Labor government, what faith can Queenslanders have that she would protect them from a you know, tyrannical government during the next pandemic? In my opinion, none. And Western Australia was just as bad in appointing a former police commissioner who, resigned, uh, who, resi who reigned during the COVID era and oversaw a period of extreme authoritarian behaviour, for which there are still court cases ongoing. Now, another unsuitable choice, in my opinion, was Kim Beasley, because obviously he is clearly a political figure inhabiting the role of governor. Now, what I'm concerned about these selections is if you pick someone who is clearly a known activist, who has very high profile political leanings that are to one side of politics, is it possible that Conservatives will look at the role of this governor and say, well, if we're going to get a, a Labour person, a left-wing activist in this role, maybe we should just ditch the whole thing entirely. I'm worried that Conservatives will lose faith in the system if they see the system has become political, which is what it's meant to avoid. Well, they should remember that when only British were appointed as Governors General, many of them came with a very big political background. And that It was known in Australia that they had political backgrounds, but it didn't disturb us. What disturbed us was when... What disturbed some of us was when they came with uh, an Australian political background. In fact, that was the King's objection, one of the King's several objections. One was the age of, uh, of uh, Sir Isaac Isaacs. He was 75. And uh, the other was that he'd never had any experience in any sort of position similar to that. But uh, Scullin insisted and the King said, well, I'm a constitutional monarch. I must uh, accept your advice, although I, I don't agree with it. Now, uh, what we've got to accept is that... Uh, uh, we, we can't judge Miss Mostyn on whether she will exercise her powers. 
when she needs to exercise them. Remember, remember the, when Gough Whitlam appointed Sir John Kerr, he thought Kerr was a pushover. He thought Kerr had no courage. And uh, he said to Hayden, when Hayden said, look, I think, I think, uh, I think that, uh, that bloke's going to act against us, which Kerr had to because constitutionally, Gough was trying to do something which was unconstitutional, that is, continue as Prime Minister without delivering supply. Gough said to, according to Hayden, Gough said to Hayden, he wouldn't have the guts. So he, he thought he'd appointed somebody to the Governor-Generalship. I think that being appointed to the Governor-Generalship, and I would hope that when people swear an oath of allegiance, they don't put their, cross their hands crossed their fingers behind their back, as one British MP did when he showed the oath of allegiance, that they do pay some respect to the fact that you're putting your hand on the Bible and swearing something before God. Well, let me put something to you. This is more a discussion of, of the broader political community in general. I agree with your discussions about former Governor-Generals and former uh, politicians who were discussing these roles, but... Let's not forget that our esteemed figures used to hold themselves to a higher standard um, than they do today. We've had people who are elected into the Senate and ministers who openly, while swearing allegiances, refuse to swear to the Crown and to the Parliament. Uh, and they do this in broad daylight of everybody. They say they don't actually believe in the institutions they serve. We've also got... Um, high court judges and judges in general who are now leaning so far left, they no longer appear to be upholding the standards of law that they were set to. I mean, listen to James Allen. He'll talk about that all day long. So <laughs> my concern is that although you could say in the past that someone might have had a political history, but they would still uphold this position, as a general idea, are we becoming more politicised, more tribalised in act activism? And is there a danger that all of our checks and balances in this system are breaking down because politicians did things in the last five years that they would never have done in the last hundred years? Well, uh, w in the ultimate analysis, it's the people who vote. I, I know that uh, I do think, and I still believe, that to an extent the elections are open to fraud because we, for example, don't, uh, re don't require the production of identity and there is that weak between the calling of the election and the closing of the rolls when there's an influx, there's a flood of uh, new enrolments which the Electoral Commission can't possibly check. So they, many of them could be fraudulent and they'll be weeded out later, well after the election. But I think we've got to assume some responsibility for governments we elect. And uh, the extraordinary thing is that the Albanese government at the present time which I think is the worst government, the most disastrous government since Federation, still is... Uh, the, the polls are still indicating that they will be a minority government after the election, for which I would blame much of the mainstream media for not doing their job holding the government to account. But uh, we, we've got a certain responsibility in who becomes Prime Minister of this country, and it is the Prime Minister whose job it is to make the recommendations to the king. The system, though, has worked so far, and it's worked very satisfactorily, and I don't think we should rush to assume that Miss Mostyn will behave unconstitutionally. My hope is that our system is strong enough to survive two or three generations of children who are raised to be hardcore Marxists and to believe in the dogma of collectivism. That's my hope, that it can survive that generation until people come to their senses again. But as always, David, it was a pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you.